Um, we're getting back to local towards the end again. We started out with a lot of good tying it back to home. And um, this next discussion is about connecting community with capital. So we've talked a lot about big investment. And this conversation is about how do we get to local and place-based investment. And um, I'm very honored to introduce our moderator, Ali Long. She is the co-founder of the Local Food Alliance, which you heard about in the very beginning when we talked about the Institute. Um, she founded the Food Alliance before the Institute was even created. And then we came together and, and um, joined forces. And the Local Food Alliance is doing incredible work to make Blaine County um, a local food a center and to engage our community to strengthen it by localizing our food system and she has a long history in working in philanthropy and impact investing and walking the walk of a lot of what we've been talking about here today and I will let her introduce the the rest of the panel but you're here a bit of what's happening in our community a bit of what's happening in other innovative places who are working to localize that investment to make a difference on resilience so please join me in welcoming Ali Long and her panel thank you Okay, thank you, Amy. Um, saves me, saves time on introductions, and I think I will um, really just cut to the chase in uh, asking some questions of our panelists because uh, their bios are online and um, in the materials. So I'll let you review those if you haven't already. Uh, as Amy said, I am a founder and director of the Local Food Alliance, and. Uh, I came into local food actually through impact investing. Um, I saw how powerful this one sector could be as a lever for just incredible amounts of change, um, building individual health, strong communities, local economies, um, immigration policy, labor policy, and of course, soil and water and air quality and environmental considerations and I was just so blown away with a prior history in philanthropy promotion and education that just by focusing on this one sector we could make so much change but the investment in communities is really um, one of the biggest things that's coming out of working in local food for me and so today we have three people who have done a lot of thinking and work in not just impact investing, but also local investing and building strong communities. Um, I'd like to start with Bill Stoddard. Um, Bill, I know you through our shared involvement in Confluence Philanthropy. <clears throat> and Confluence, if for those of you who don't know, you should check it out, it's pretty cool. The eight-year-old organization that supports and catalyzes private, public, and community foundations individuals, families, and values-aligned investment managers all towards impact investment strategies. And um, Bill, you demonstrate in your history of work um, a commitment to leveraging wealth for purpose, promoting clean portfolios, and bridging the gap between investors and the companies that they support. And I'm wondering why you're so committed um, with Homestake to uh, local investment models and um, finding ways to capitalize the smaller, sort of less scalable businesses that are often really the, the strongest fibers of community fabric. Can you speak a little bit to that? You bet. Is this working? Hello? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Hallie, and thanks, Amy, and your team. This is just tremendous. And to everyone out here, innovators and you know thought leaders, it's just been super inspirational, so thank you. Um, you know, with respect to Homestake, it sort of evolved out of, you know, what I call my day job, which is as an investment advisor, uh, I have my own firm. Um, and, uh, you know, a friend and client came to me early on and said, hey, I want to invest locally. And I said, well, you know, we could do talk about real estate, you know, we could, uh, you know, there's municipal bonds, that kind of thing. He said, no, I want to invest in the coffee shop down there. And I said, well, do you know them? You know, do, do they need money? And he kind of looked at me sort of bewildered, like as if that didn't matter, um, which was kind of telling. Um, and, uh, you know, but it got me on this journey of thinking, well, okay, you know, that is, I think, a really interesting counterpoint to, you know, sort of global capitalism, to Wall Street, um, and also in particular, as we found out, to sort of venture capital 
and the, you know, sort of the gap between venture capital and bank financing or SBA lending. Um, and so we started to really explore that space. Um, and my partner and I, um, you know, began to really look at, well, okay, you know, here's some pieces from, you know, the lending community that is really working great. We don't need to replicate that, but maybe we'll take a piece of that. Um, there's some really great work going on in venture capital, of course, as we've all seen. Um, maybe we'll take a piece of that. Um, there's some innovative financing models, you know, hybrid uh, type of approaches, convertibles, uh, revenue-based uh, financing. And what we realized, too, as we sort of began to explore the pipeline locally, um, was that <laughs> It was everything from you know real estate type deals to you know straight up startups um, you know in tech or what have you and we kind of got to thinking like geez it would be interesting to you know build a committed fund around this but these things are such disparate types of deals the needs are so different for all these different businesses that it didn't make any sense to go try and raise a bunch of money and then say oh by the way this doesn't really fit and oh we can't really help you either because you don't fit. Um, and, you know, another part of it as we thought about it is this ecosystem approach, you know. It, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, here's a bunch of money, go do that thing. Um, you know, the, a lot of these businesses sort of need that graduate level support. Um, and the reason we think it's really important is, you know, over half the jobs in the U.S. are with small businesses, non-publicly traded companies, you know, the Main Street type businesses um, that we, you know, see and patronize every day. Uh, and we got to thinking about, well, you know, a lot of these businesses want to grow. A lot of these businesses maybe even want to transition. Um, you know, a lot of these businesses have other needs that are not going to be met by a lot of traditional financing, you know, methods and models. Um, you know, I know that we're short on time, so I'll just cut to a real quick story about, you know, one of the deals we're working on right now um, is this local couple. They've been doing um, sustainable organic uh, ag for, um, oh gosh, almost 10 years now, uh, and they're wanting to expand. They have this tremendous opportunity to uh, buy a, you know, 65-acre farm and expand their operations. They've got a great plan, and what we do is we bring a network of subscribers, local people who want to help support these deals uh, and these businesses together um, to help finance these uh, particular businesses and operations. And so that's what we're doing literally as we speak, um, you know, is helping, you know, get this deal financed for this couple that otherwise, you know, they're going to get a little bit of FSA money, you know, not really quite there for um, bankability. Um, and, you know, the folks that we're working with are saying, you know, we're long-term patient investors, and this is the type of thing that we want to see for our communities. So, thanks. That's, it, the subscription model, too, is a really interesting thing to apply to this sector, I think. I've been interested in that since you shared that in New Orleans. Um, I'll move quickly on to Kristen. Kristen, you and I have been running in the same circles for a really long time, and it's been really cool to watch uh, what you've done and what you're doing, and I'm so appreciative, sort of on the heels of um, Sarah and Cass, whom I don't know but would love to know better, and the um, you know gender-specific uh, um, statistics that they shared and you are working specifically with women at NIA and um, I would love for you to to share with us if you've seen and how you've seen th um, this gender specific approach uh, impacting a more community based approach and if you're seeing um, any connection between women and local. Thank you, Allie, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, we are at that witching hour of, you know, I'm gonna say, I need a cocktail, so. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you're still here with us, I'm so grateful. <laughs> what you got for me? Is it locally made? Yes. Um, so I do my investing mainly in Oakland for my private portfolio, and then I invest on Wall Street in NIA Global Solutions um, for publicly traded companies. And I found that the mix is really helpful, particularly in the Bay Area in California. So much affects um, our local community. Um, I started investing just in good stuff. I had a tremendous mentor, Joel Solomon, who does amazing work. And his advice really was to just get it out there into good stuff. And I was doing that. And 
I just want to back up to say that the good stuff, the people that found out, oh, she's an angel investor, she's going to do this, were what I call the Stanford boys. And they're adorable. They're super cute. They've got this solar something, <laughs> something. They've got something that they're going to, you know, and they're great. And they've learned to get their power pitch in business school, because that's where they met. And, um, and they'll take your money. And you'll give it to them, because they're, you know, but I guess having done enough of that, I realized, am I really investing into the economy that I need to see? Am I investing into the world that I want to live in? And that world isn't 100% male run. So um, after a while and years of investing, I've shifted. And um, one, because my female-led uh, portfolio companies are doing better. Um, it's also about the quality, but also the numbers I talked about earlier. I'm just really needing to we need to be more than 4% of the capital that's out there. So with my tiny pot, I'm trying to shift that. Um, I'll say just one example, um, and I mentioned it earlier, the Impact Hub, which is a co-working space and incubator. Um, it's the only one that's actually led by women of color. Um, I'm a founder, so it's all women, um, but our CEO is a woman of color. and. We are off the charts as far as that nurturing component. And it's not that men aren't nurturing, but I think when you put a lot of women in, there's just a different quality of things. And so we do have males involved, of course, um, and we love it, and yet there is a very different quality. Um, the other part I think that um, makes women entrepreneurs successful um, is that and this is stereotypically, but women are often willing to ask for help. Um, and so when you're getting into trouble as a company, you might actually reach out to your neighbor. And that might look like help. It might look like a collaboration. Um, it might look like a shared business model or even just a shared business expense. Um, but there's a lot of collaborations that I see happening, um, particularly in the investments I'm making in Oakland. Oh, one more thing. I have my portfolio. I'm 100% invested um, with my values, and I carry it around. I take it to the grocery store. You know, I take it everywhere. I'm happy to hand it to you. It's on the web. It's um, just one sample of what you can do um, with lots of different ideas about how you can get started in impact investing. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, a friend of mine, Luann Brizendine, wrote a book called The Female Brain which has just been made into a movie. And one of the very accessible statistics she uses is the part of the brain that is dedicated to connection is, I think, 80% bigger in females. Anyway, that can be good and bad. Um, <laughs> but so uh, it's, I love that we will ask for help. And um, so I'll turn to you, Werner. We did not uh, know each other really when we overlapped for three years at Dartmouth, but um, I really appreciated working with you at the Institute for the past few years and since its inception. And you and I have noodled qu quite a few um, ideas for sort of cross-sectoral uh, investment opportunities that blend um, renewable energy, food production, and land use. Um, and I know that you're really focused on, on land and what can be done with this amazing resource that we have here in Idaho. Um, and it's a beautiful representation of local. And um, so I'm wondering if you would um, talk a little bit about sort of in the face of investors' perception that um, local investment is less diversified and potentially riskier or maybe even just uh, a little scarier or more difficult given the up close and personal um, situation that you have, you might run into your investee or your investor in the grocery store. Um, so in the face of all those, if you could share a little bit on your of your perspective on um, the risks and opportunities, the underutilized asset of land, and, um, and really, in, for the purpose of, of this institute and this event, um, their uh, potential to increase local resilience. Yeah, thanks, Allie. It's been great to work with you as well. You have great ideas and have you know, contributed a lot to the way I think about it. Um, you know, it was interesting to me thinking about local investing. I, I came most recently from a kind of traditional hedge fund background um, where, um, you know, there's all the exposures to international um, equities and, you know, some concern about not really knowing where the money is and how it's being held and, and 
um, much less the investment, but also outside risks, you know, bank solvencies, stuff like that. So, you know, I always thought local investing, that, that should play a role in a portfolio because people can drive down the street and they can look at their investment and they, you know, chances are in a small town like this, they're gonna know the people that are actually managing, you know, the store, so to speak. Um, and so I, I really thought, you know, that should be appealing to people in this time of, you know, some global uncertainty and, and global risk. And, you know, it was one conversation with a, with a very sophisticated, experienced investor locally um, where I was kind of explaining, uh, you know, my, my tenant, and, and he said, I would never invest locally. And, and uh, you know, I said, well, well why? Um, and I can understand not allocating your entire portfolio, but wouldn't you allocate some? And he said, the point Ali said, you know, I, if I have to make a hard decision about my investment, I don't want to have to see that person in the grocery store in the morning, right? And, and that was kind of an interesting eye-opener to me, and it, you know, started me thinking about, you know, some of those, those elements of local investing, and in particular, the tendency to have um, externalities uh, be included in local investments, i.e., you can make an investment somewhere far removed, and it might be a great investment for a while, but in the end, it might have created more problems uh, than it solved due to things that weren't factored into the market, be it, you know, pollution or be it long-term toxic effects or, or what have you. But if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't live there, you don't really care. And if you do live there, um, you're gonna care much more about that. And so I think uh, the nature of local investing tends to give people a longer horizon because it's in their backyard. And you know, unless they're planning on moving, um, they're gonna have to live with the consequences. So uh, you know, I, I guess that's an opportunity and it's also a challenge. Um, but I, you know, it was something that was eye-opening for me. You know, the general approach um, through the institute um, that I've taken, you know, I agree with, you know, some of the earlier speakers of, you know, the power is the market. You know, the market can, if, if something works and is financially sustainable, it tends to scale very quickly. And so I thought if you really want to make an impact, you have to do something that is economically sustainable and ultimately profitable. Um, and so how do you do that? And how do we do that locally uh, in this valley in particular? Because this is where I live and this is where I raise my kids and, and we have our family. Um, and so one key approach was looking at underutilized assets. What are the assets that we already have? And how can we use those ass assets in different ways that aren't currently being considered? Maybe it's using new technologies. Maybe it's thinking about it uh, from a different perspective than the people who have been using, using the uh, technology or, or, or the asset today. Um, and, and an example of that is, is a greenhouse um, uh, that is being used by a landscape company. And the landscape company was using propane to heat their greenhouse. And as a result, in the winter, they weren't going to use their greenhouse, number one, because their landscape business didn't really need to plant plants in the winter. Um, and number two, it costs a lot to heat it. And so we looked at it and said, well, you know, and this is something that Ali was involved with, and Ali, Ali originally came to me with this, with this idea. Um, what if we used uh, solar thermal um, that would have a payback uh, on top of the propane, you know, a, a more cost-efficient propane for, for their heating needs? And the beauty of that is that there's no incremental cost in the winter because you've already set up the system. And so now you have an asset that is underutilized in the winter that has no marginal cost for heating, and what if we did? What if we included that asset and repurposed it to grow food in the winter, um, greens, something like that? And uh, the, the the additional benefit to that is the company, you know, had issues with cyclicality in terms of hiring, um, where the winter was a slow period, so they have to let people off, and then rehire in the summer. And so you had, you know, the 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 the, the business issues with having to scale up and scale down seasonally. And so that is an example that I'm talking about of how can we look at assets that already exist today and think of either utilizing new technologies, utilizing human capital that exists in this valley um, to deploy it against that asset and make it, number one, more cost effective, more profitable, and number two, deal with some of these issues of resilience, local food production, um, more sustainable jobs, longer term jobs, things like that. Um, another example is, is land um, that, that Ali mentioned. There's, there's a lot of land in this valley and a lot of it's being underutilized. And so one landowner came to, came to us and you know, we pitched him on 
you know, how can we make this land um, not just kind of a store of long-term value, which is the way I think he kind of looked at it. I just want to own this land, and over time it's going to go up. But in the meantime, how can we put businesses or business models, uh, you know, in place that generate income in the near term will generate, you know, be more profitable in the longer term um, if the environment changes, um, and and you know have that benefit in addition to uh, uh, the asset of the land itself. And so an example of that was using technologies. Um, there's there talk about the Appalachian greenhouses, but there's some you know really interesting um, greenhouse technologies today. Um, so we did a bunch of market research on you know does does the business model work? Could you sell produce uh, at a price? That, uh, that warrants the investment in, 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 in the asset and, in, and the technology. And so that's, that's another example, and I don't have a lot of time to go into, into the details, but there was multiple layering elements of you know, energy generation, local, for, lo local workforce housing that you, you could apply on this property, greenhouse, local food production, the benefits that, that, that aren't even factored in. When you think about the non-market benefits of local food, fresher food in the winter, et cetera, you know, health, benefits to health. We're just talking about pure financial returns in the near term that make it economically sustainable. So that's been our goal. How can we use the market? How can we come up with a solution and do the research to make sure that, you know, there's a good chance that the market exists, that the pricing exists to make this thing sustainable? And the reason I like talking, I don't know how many people here are, are from, from the Valley, but I think there's a lot of assets out there that we don't know about. And so I like to talk about things like this because my hope is that people will say, hey, you know, I've got this asset or I've got some land or I've got something that could, is underutilized. And, and if so, um, you know, we'd love to hear about it and, and you know, maybe uh, brainstorm about it and see how we could do similar things. Thanks, Werner. You know, that is really what it's all about. It's about leveraging the underutilized assets or just the people in our community and Bill I've always loved what the name you guys came up with home stake it is that we all have a stake in our home and in our own communities and so why not leverage that tie that connection it's a very qualitative connection but I think that um, it's a powerful one and it just hasn't received the attention that it deserves so uh, I invite all of you to be inspired by these implementers and just think a little bit more about how you might integrate your own community and the stake that you have in that community uh, into how, where you direct your, your capital, be that financial, human, intellectual, uh, in kind, whatever. Just see what you can do to um, leverage the stake you have in your, in your home space. I think, are we on time? Oh. I have a couple quick plugs. So local community here in Sun Valley, they do a gallery walk on Fridays and that's today, that's this afternoon. So in between your dinner and your conversations, drag your people to some of the most fabulous galleries actually in the world are here. And I think you guys know the stats better than I do, but I know Sun Valley is rated extremely highly for their art and this is the community event. So um, I encourage everyone to get out to the gallery walk. Yeah, and it's all right here. And if you walk two blocks uh, north, mountains to the west. If you walk two blocks north, um, you'll start seeing the people milling around and you can just drop into the galleries. Okay, last plug. If you want to get started in investing in your local community, there's a website that friends of mine have put up and it's called Investibule and you can go to investibule.co. You can search put in the name of your local community and it will show you what investments are available. You can also add as many screens as you want, arts, education, solar, women-led company. Um, it's a fun place to get started and some really low minimums in your local communities. Thank you, and Amy, thank you so much thank for this you. opportunity. Thank you very much, you guys. Thank you, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you, Allie.